Well, a very good evening and thank you for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Ashmit Kumar and here are the headlines of it tracking at this hour. The World Economic Forum kicks off in Davos with fears of global recession looming large. IMF says international relationships are worsening after decades, warns that economic fragmentation could cut global economic output by up to 7%. India is seen as a bright spot by investors at Davos amidst a gloomy global growth outlook. Top Indian CEOs are upbeat about restarting the CapEx cycle. They expect the government to continue with infrastructure spending ahead of the upcoming budget. As the world's rich and powerful gather at Davos, Oxfam warns of widening inequality. A new report shows richest 1% have amassed nearly two-thirds of all global wealth created since the pandemic. The top 1% of India's population owns more than 40% of the country's wealth. Wholesale price inflation in India falls below 5%, the slowest pace of growth in the last 22 months. Fall in food prices was the key driver. India's trade deficit in December remains largely flat at nearly $24 billion. Exports and imports rise on a monthly basis but decline on a yearly basis. Sources say government is looking for alternate export markets like Brazil and Netherlands, among others, to boost exports. Union Law Minister Kiran Rijiju writes to the Chief Justice of India, Justice D.Y. Chandrachur, seeks a government representative in the Collegium which appoints judges to higher courts. Opposition parties slam the move, calling it a poison pill for an independent judiciary. Law Minister Hitzpak says his letter is in conformity with the observations and directions of the Supreme Court Constitution Bench. Tech Mahindra C.P. Gurnani rules out any immediate announcement about his successor says he will be in the saddle till the end of 2023, promises that margins will improve every quarter, but stops short of giving a guidance. Layoffs continue across startups. Dunzo fires 3% of its staff. ShareChat cuts 20% of its workforce. Rebel Foods lays off less than 2% of its employees. Viacom 18 bags the rights to broadcast the inaugural edition of Women's Indian Premier League. Viacom 18 will shell out nearly $117 million, which translates to more than 7 crore rupees for every match. Nepal observes a day of mourning after the worst aviation disaster in three decades that killed 68 people. Investigators find the black box and the cockpit voice recorder of the Yeti Airlines plane that crashed yesterday. Russia and Belarus begin joint air force drills, sparking fears of a new offensive in Ukraine. Western intelligence officials say that Moscow could use its ally to launch a new ground campaign. This even as Russia continues to pound cities in eastern Ukraine. Well, it's that time of the year when the world's rich and influential descend on the Swiss Alps in Davos for the annual gathering of the World Economic Forum. Now, more than 1,500 leaders, including 300 policymakers and 600 CEOs, are in attendance as fears of a global recession loom large. Now, the IMF has warned that global economic output could decline by up to 7% if international relations continue to deteriorate and economic fragmentation continues. India, meanwhile, is a bright spot according to several economists and industry leaders at Davos. There is consensus that even a global recession should not throw a major spanner for India's growth momentum. Economic globalization has helped lift a billion people out of poverty in the last 30 years. A pullback of that globalization is going to do long-term damage to the prospects of increasing everybody's living standards. So it's important that we come back to a kind of cooperation and it's going to be a journey it's not something that's going to change overnight because leaders need to come out of this very short-term insular inward looking crisis driven mindset that they've been in understandably given the shocks that have been happening but now it's time to start looking again at the medium term and start looking at cooperation china surprisingly decided 
COVID zero, maybe we're getting rid of it. And short term, that may lead to a boost to global growth. But I think underlying, it's still very difficult. Uh, still continuing war in Ukraine and Russia, uh, rising global interest rates, or at least high global interest rates because of inflation. Uh, I mentioned uh, geopolitics. And I think China, although in the near term, it may do well. Everybody's been locked up and they want to go spend money. But I think longer term, China has a lot of problems. Their growth model had uh, featured tons of construction, roads, bridges, apartment buildings, offices, like we haven't seen outside Spain and Ireland just before they're collapsed. Secondly, the centralization of power uh, has, can't be good for growth. I mean, it, it was already centralized. And not only has President Xi centralized it more, he's gotten rid of a lot of the technocrats. China had some very good technocrats. He seems to have gotten rid of them. Well, India has a huge presence at Davos this year. A 200-member strong contingent is in Davos, led by union ministers Ashwini Vaishnav, Smriti Irani, and some of India's top business leaders. India's IT companies have set up their own pavilions, as they do every year. Amidst a cloudy scenario for global growth, India is seen as a bright spot. Speaking exclusively to Shireen Bhan, top Indian CEOs exuded confidence about the India story. They expect acceleration in foreign inflows and higher capex by the private sector as we move forward in 2023. Well, there's no question that India has been the most resilient major economy uh, and, uh, you know, looks to be doing better than the other big emerging markets. India also, uh, for example, some of its exports are more resilient to supply chains. The tech sector has been very resilient in India. So, you know, by and large, uh, India seems to be resilient. Even if there is a recession, maybe it won't be as dramatic in India. India, uh, and I know that, you know, there's a lot of interest at this point in time, especially when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, what's happening in China and then, of course, the, the manufacturing uh, destinations that the world is looking at at this point in time. Uh, one of the fastest growing large economies today. What's the mood like on India? You know, I remember when you and I spoke uh, back in May and we were, uh, you know, we were bullish in India and we frankly continue to be bullish. The general feeling is that the worst is over. There's always a caveat, right? Because we do live in very uncertain yes. times. Across other sectors, especially when I look at financial services, we continue to see hiring. There is a dramatic change, at least in financial services, oh. happening because of the digitalization of financial services. Today, I know we ourselves will hire this year over three to 4,000 engineers in a financial services company, and we'll probably continue doing that the next three or four years. I believe that outside of tech, you will see hiring continue, may not be very strong, as I said, the first couple of quarters, but uh, thereafter you should see it growing. No reason why India shouldn't be a big exporter of steel. You know, India has the raw materials. When I look at our customer segments, if you look at automotive, they are back to where they were four years back. Uh, if you look at construction, it's quite strong. Industrial buildings, a lot of investments going on in supply chains, warehousing, a lot of investments in oil and gas. So all that will trigger private sector investment. So I think uh, we are probably six months to one year away from getting private sector investment back. I think we are going to see a new uh, era that is going to come through. Uh, also, I think the, the cycle, you know, as, as uh, Narendra was saying, this, the, the movement in which business is going to happen mm. will be very rapid. The cut in personal income tax only at the lower segment, mm. we believe will help these people stretch their rupee a little bit more. I don't anticipate, uh, you know, the government to be raising taxes we also speaking at Davos, C.P. Gurnani, the current managing director and CEO at Tech Mahindra, said that he will continue to be at the helm of the company till the end of the year. And when asked about the next CEO, he said that no immediate announcement will be made. The communication to the stock exchange has been very clear that I am on the saddle till December 23, and the successor would be a CEO designate. Uh, there is no immediate announcement. So we will have to wait for a little while. Well, meanwhile, as the world's rich and influential gather at Davos, Oxfam has released a new report showing how inequality is widening across the world. According to the report, the richest 1% of people have accounted for two-thirds of the new wealth created since the pandemic. 
The Oxfam report also claims that India's top 1% owned more than 40% of the country's total wealth. In fact, in 2021, the bottom 50% owned only 3% of India's wealth. Oxfam has suggested implementing progressive tax measures in budget this year. It has called for more taxes on the super-rich and proceeds from that to be used to raise India's health care budget to 2.5% of the GDP by 2025 and hike the education budget to 6% of the GDP. The majority of this country at the moment is facing hardships. And while this is happening, you're looking at a very small bunch of people. Uh, and as our report says that this is really becoming a country only for the rich. For the every rupee earned by men in the last one year, women have earned only 63 paisa. Even an uh, IMF is talking about the levels of inequality being unsustainable. We'll go to the day's market action now. The Lal Street reversed the opening gains amidst volatility due to selling by foreign investors. Both Nifty and Sensex slipped a percent from the day's high, with bank and mid-cap index falling too. However, IT stocks managed to rise as major earnings flowed in. Some relief in wholesale prices. WPI inflation for December has softened to less than 5%. This is the first time the index has slipped below the 5% mark since February of 2021. Uh, let's take a look at the internals. Inflation in food, vegetables, primary articles and manufacturing products softened in December. However, fuel, par, meat and potato inflation was marginally higher. Trade deficit in December is also flat. Lata Venkatesh now joins us with a quick roundup of all the macro numbers. Yes, that's right. The wholesale price index for December has fallen to 4.9% and our CNBC TV18 poll was 5.57%. November was 585 So compared to the market, it is about 70 basis points lower. And compared to November, it's a full 100 basis points lower. This is largely because there's a huge fall in vegetable prices, about... 22% month on month and, you know, 35% year on year. Other things, a little bit of fuel, because in fuel, you don't count the excise duties when you uh, count at the wholesale level. So petrol, diesel have also fallen and a lot of metals and uh, basic metals have also fallen from year ago levels. The, re the uh, fall to 4.9 has led a lot of economists to believe now that the Reserve Bank could have a window of not hiking in February because the CPI inflation for December also came in at 5.7, where there was widespread expectation of 5.9. Since both indices have come in lower than and substantially lower than expected, there is a window opening up that there could be a pause from the Monetary Policy Committee in February. Uh, but the bond market did not react. There was no rally out there because they are more worried about whether the market borrowing will be too overwhelming when the budget comes out uh, on Feb 1st. Coming to the trade deficit, uh, yes, the trade deficit at 23.7 billion is practically unchanged from the November figure, which was 23.8 billion. Now, I'm not comparing it with year ago December because commodity prices were much higher in 2021. So both imports and exports have fallen from year ago levels. If you take the merchandise, that is goods plus services, then again, the deficit is 11.1 billion in December, 11.98 uh, billion in December compared to 11.1 billion in November. Again, flat. The rupee fell, not because of the trade deficit at all. The rupee has been falling because of relentless selling by foreign funds who are moving out of Indian equities into other Asian equity markets. And there is also a fear that the Reserve Bank does not want the rupee to appreciate and so it's buying dollars. Therefore, no rally in the bond or in the rupee market today, despite data uh, meriting some, some kind of a rally. Right, Lata, thanks a lot for that wrap of all the macro numbers. But stay, speaking of macros, current account deficits spiking to 4.4% of the GDP in the second quarter and exports declining to 12% uh, in December. The government is working on measures to boost exports to newer markets and to check imports of Chinese goods. Abhimanyu Sharma is now joining us with more on that. Abhimanyu, tell us, uh, what are some of these measures that the government is looking at? 
India is aiming to increase its exports to countries which are experiencing growth like Brazil. India is also uh, looking to add more geographies to its export list, even as several key nations to which exports used to take place earlier are experiencing a slowdown. Hence, India is looking at other options to increase its exports. Uh, the possibility of a rise in electronic exports to Russia is also being looked at due to a huge demand for Indian electronics in the country. Uh, government sources have indicated that under invoicing and import of substandard goods from China continues to remain a cause of concern. Hence, action is being taken by the Customs and Revenue Department in this regard. As far as the availability of food is concerned and the review of export ban is there, uh, the government is looking at domestic production, food stock and market availability before pushing for any food exports. All government departments are ensuring ample availability of wheat stock and any clearance uh, for export of wheat will only come after several government departments reach a consensus about ample domestic availability of wheat. Last year, the export of wheat was heavily regulated by the government after crops had failed in various parts of North India due to a severe heat wave. It remains to be seen what decision will be taken in this regard by the government. Thanks a lot for that update, Abhimanyu. Now, lays off continue to hit the startup space from Ola, Dunzo to ShareChat, uh, among others. Employees are receiving pink slips as companies reduce their costs. Shilpa Rani Peta now joins us with the latest. Shilpa, over to you. The slew of layoffs that we saw in 2022 in the Indian startup ecosystem seems to have spilled into 2023 as well. In just the first two weeks of January, several companies have laid off employees. Now, Dunzo, for instance, laid off about 3% of its staff last week, and it has said that it is offering uh, full support to to the layer of employees during this transition. Apart from that, there's also short video app uh, Share Chat that also laid off about 20%, which is roughly 500 employees. And the company has said that this is because, se because of several macroeconomic factors that has impacted cost and the availability of capital. This company too is offering support to employees in the form of extended health uh, insurance cover, uh, variable pay among others. And the company is also aggressively optimizing its cost. Remember, it had also shut down its fantasy sports platform last month in December where it had laid off about 115 employees. Then there's also food tech company uh, Rebel Foods, which laid off about, uh, the company says that it laid off only less than 2% of its staff, and this is on account of annual performance evaluation and the real and realigning of priorities for the company. Last week, too, we saw a few other companies like Ola, which laid off nearly 200 employees in its engineering and uh, design departments. Lead with an ad tech startup also laid off about 60% of its employees. Cash Free, a fintech startup, also laid off about 6 to 8 percent of its staff which amounts to about roughly 80 employees and Moglix also which laid off about 2 to 3 percent of its staff. So clearly it's not just the big tech globally that we're seeing. India's consumer tech companies are also feeling the pain of the global economic downturn. Back to you. Well with that it's time now to slip into a very short break but coming up on the other side over 90 percent of the world's diamonds are cut and polished in Gujarat Surat with diamond demand slowing down. What does the industry expect from the union budget? A special report when we come back. Welcome back. Now, Union Law Minister Kiran Rijiju writes to the Chief Justice of India, Justice Diva Chandrachur, seeking a government representative in the Collegium, which appoints judges to higher courts. Now, opposition parties slam the move, calling it a poison pill for an independent judiciary. Law Minister hit back, saying that his letter is in conformity with the observations and directions of the Supreme Court Constitution Bench. BJP's two-day national executive meet kick-started today. Prime Minister Modi held a roadshow in Delhi as the party prepared for upcoming state elections. At the meeting, the BJP leaders brainstormed ideas as they geared up to fight nine assembly elections this year. The Indian Med Department predicts that severe cold wave conditions will persist over parts of North India till Wednesday. Minimum temperature is expected to fall by 2 degrees Celsius over some parts until tomorrow. The department says that temperatures will gradually rise after tomorrow by 3 to 5 degrees Celsius until the western disturbances provide some relief. Well, over 90% of the world's diamonds are cut and polished in Surat, Gujarat. But... Repercussions of the Ukraine-Russia war and China's COVID situation has wiped out nearly 35% of the global demand. 
also leading to widespread layoffs. Shilpa Rani Peta now reports from Surat that without government support and friendly export policies, India's diamond city could lose its sheen. Twenty-seven-year-old Premal Sakarya has been cutting and polishing diamonds for nearly ten years across various companies in Surat. But that came to a grinding halt post Diwali when the company he'd been working at for the past two years suddenly shut down, leaving him and nearly 200 others jobless. A plunge in global demand for diamonds has forced several of the 7,000-plus diamond units in Surat to either lay off staff or shut operations. The Diamond Workers Union claims that since Diwali, at least 20,000 workers have been laid off across Surat's $40 billion diamond industry. However, diamond merchants say that the extent of job losses is exaggerated and that most companies have been cutting down working hours and not laying off people. मेरा ऐसा मानना है कि कई कतार गांव में एक कंपनी थी नाम उसका मैं आप नहीं बता सकता प्राइवेसी के बारे में तो वो 700 वर्कर्स जे छह महीनों में ही बंद होगी ऐसी छोटी बड़ी कंपनी दो तीन अभी बंद हुई है लेकिन हमारे पास जो कंप्लेंट्स आती हैं उस कंप्लेंट्स की बात करें तो रोजाना दो से तीन कंप्लेंट्स किसी को वर्कर को अभी जॉब से छुट्टी नहीं दी गई है लेकिन वर्कर को टाइम कंजप्शन कर रहे हैं जो पहले 8 घंटे का कारोबार करा रहे थे वो 6 घंटे के कर रहे हैं Surat is the world's largest hub for diamonds with every 14 out of 15 diamonds sold in the world being cut and polished in Surat and 90% of this is exported largely to the US and China However, due to the Ukraine-Russia war causing a global economic downturn, followed by COVID lockdowns in China, has crippled the demand for this precious stone in the past 10 months. The polish, the polishing, the production, is not big. Before, we understood that 100 hira was big, now it is 60 hira. This is the biggest problem. While global uncertainties continue, the industry believes government support will go a long way in helping Surat survive the tough environment. The Gem and Jewelry Export Promotion Council has asked the government to allow sale of rough diamonds through a special notified zone to facilitate trade between SMEs and diamond mining companies and also allow diamond exporters to benefit from policies of major mining countries in Africa. तो ई-कॉमर्स के अंदर जो अभी सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट 2% इक्विलाइजेशन लेवी डाला है वो कोई भी इंडियन कंपनी यहां से वो ई-कॉमर्स के माध्यम से बिजनेस करेंगे तो 2% एक्स्ट्रा देना पड़ता है हाई वैल्यू के अंदर 2% कहां जाके रुकेगा गवर्नमेंट को दो साल से रिक्वेस्ट करें कि भाई इसको आप घटाइए तो छोटे लोग काम कर कारोबार कर सकेंगे बड़े लोगों के साथ कॉम्पीट नहीं कर पाएंगे other demands also include a repair policy for jewellery and cashing in on the growing demand for lab-grown diamonds. The diamond industry in Surat is also asking the government to remove the 7.5% import duty on the raw material for lab-grown diamonds, demand for which has been growing. The industry is also pinning its hopes on this upcoming diamond bores here in Surat, which they say will not only boost volumes, but will also give smaller merchants access to global markets and potentially create over 50,000 jobs. In Surat, with camera person Ajay Dabolkar, Shilpa Rani Peta. Well, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business R. Thank you so much for watching. News and updates continue right here on CNBC TV 18.